Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs live Q&A. These Q&As are held in the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle. And the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle is a closed Facebook group for people who are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. And the Deer Dog Training Blueprint is a 12-part, month-by-month video series with everything you need to train your own deer dog. Whether you're starting out with a young pup or retraining an older dog, the Deer Dog Training Blueprint has everything you need. To find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, all under Big Game Indicating Dogs. We have loads of free videos, these Q&As and hunting videos. Or you can go straight to biggameindicatingdogs.com and find out more about it there. And you can also check out the Paul Michaels Revolution podcast to listen to the audio version of these Q&As if you've found this Q&A in video format on Facebook or YouTube. It's also up in podcast format, audio format on the Paul Michaels Revolution podcast, available on all the good podcast apps. Right, so let's get into this Q&A. We've got a few questions here. Good few questions. Let's have a quick sip of my drink. <clears throat> Caleb Christie. Hi Paul, on a recent hunt I had shot a deer and gave it a while before looking for it. Dog got onto a blood trail and tracked it for a while but when the blood dried up the dog gave up and we didn't end up finding it. In brackets, wasn't a very good shot. Is there any is there any extra training I could do to help with this? Thanks. As far as training, um, so aside from, you know, sort of handling techniques in the bush and how you handle that whole situation, um, this topic actually comes up again later on in this Q&A. Um, I've got stuff popping up all over the place here. You could do more skin drags, Caleb. Uh, do it the same way that we do them in the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. Basically, just get a piece of skin, drag it around in the blueprint. We go in deep into detail on that, and I demonstrate it with print. But um, it's basically just getting a, a reasonably fresh piece of deer skin. You can also freeze... Um, what I did is if, when I shot a deer, some people have to ask around the, the inner circle is good for this people. I know Caleb, you you won't have any trouble getting deer skin. I'm sort of elaborating a bit here for the listeners. Um, you know, you can ask around, get a bit of deer skin um, and I'd cut a whole deer skin up into small pieces and then bag it up and put it in the freezer so I have you know, six or eight piece, small pieces of deer skin, about a foot by a foot, 300 millimetres by 300 millimetres, somewhere around that size. It can be a bit bigger, it can be a bit smaller. Um, and lay a skin drag, drag it um, with a bit of string. And, you know, as in the blueprint, we go through it step by step in loads of detail. But start off not nice and short and easy. Um, we also go and get into um, laying them with a uh, fishing line, casting it and walking right around and um, winding it back across with the wind or blowing the right way and all that sort of thing so you get a very clean skin drag without the mixed up scent of uh, us actually walking and dragging it so that the pup or dog is tracking us and the skin um, but Caleb you could just th this would be this is the first suggestion of a few that I'll give you here um, is just lay some big long skin drags and you, you can make them as long as you want you know and really elaborate and long you could do them in the bush um and just show your dog remind your dog that hey we once we're tracking this thing we want to find it um and the beauty with laying a skin drag is if you've laid it yourself you know where it goes and if your dog pulls off it you can put it back on it and keep it on it and just keep it going, you know, keep giving it your walk in front command and try to keep it tracking. 
Um, so lots more skin work basically as per the blueprint. Um, but outside of that, <clears throat> um, so you're saying dog got onto a blood trail and tracked it for a while, but when the blood dried up, the dog gave up and we didn't end up finding it. It wasn't a real good shot. Um, one thing I'm, I want to chip in here, and I'll chip in on the other one too, is um, you know every now and again you don't get them. You don't get them all, you know. Um, and I know it's you know it sucks. I I actually um, had a run for years and years where I never lost a deer. Um, I've lost one or two in the last couple of years, um, <clears throat> just in different circumstances. One was on private land, and there were just truckloads of other deer there. There were just way too many deer there, and um, we we're running into mob after mob of deer in the bush. And there was this deer that was very lightly hit. They just kept running off with all these other deer, and we just got to the point where you know we don't know what to do next here. Um, there's just sign everywhere. We tracked it for ages. We couldn't find any more blood. We're just hitting all these other deer, and we just, I absolutely hate doing it. Um, but we just couldn't get it. I can't get them all sometimes, you know. Um, aside from that, uh, you can kick in and start helping your dog. Um, you know, if. You're tracking a deer and the blood runs out. You can find the mark again, put the dog on it, give it your walk in front command and tell it to keep going. You know, um, like all, the whole time I'm hunting, I'll always have a GPS on me and I always have the track on. Um, and I don't turn it off. I don't turn it off and on. It's always on and the track is always on. Um, and I keep it topped up on batteries and everything. And that way, if anything happens, if I shoot a deer, <clears throat> things happen quickly. I track away from that spot um, in a hurry. I can always come back and find it. And, and if I hit an animal um, and it, it turns into a tracking job, uh, as soon as it goes past the point of finding the deer very quickly and easily, I mark where the deer was um, when I shot it I'll mark the last place I saw it and then as soon as blood begins to become difficult to find I start marking the next lot of blood all on the GPS so I can always come back and start again and then and, and these are all just principles of good tracking you know back in the day you would be um, a, a common bow hunter's trick is um, take toilet paper and the, the hanging toilet paper up because um, if you don't get back to it you know toilet paper just breaks down in the rain so as you go um, they're marking with toilet paper you might snap a couple of ferns over or something you're always marking where you're going where you've been um, with that idea that you can always come back to the start and start again um, and when things are starting to get a little bit dicey with the dog that's what I do too and if the dog if it peters out and the dog goes off um, I'll bring it back to my last confirmed blood and start again and then if the dog gets unsure again then I need to slow right down and I'll start branching out myself um, try to find another spot of blood try to find another mark and pick it up again um, sometimes when you get off track with the dog or the dog maybe turns off from the wounded deer and um, starts tracking one that's not wounded and then it realizes that later on but you're pushing the dog on and the dog doesn't know that it can turn around and go back because you've trained it to keep tracking the deer but it's found itself tracking the wrong one so then they'll get all uncertain and veer off or they may even just overshoot the mark wind another deer and get sidetracked that way um that's when it's really it's a it's a handling issue and it, it for me um when i'm working with a dog like that or you know a dog that's starting out um i'm always being real careful and it's, it's, it comes back to that thing of it, it's a 50-50 deal between the handler and the dog um, and I'm always 
thinking about how I can set the dog up um, and even help it to get back on track and start off again. Um, and you can, a dog can get confused. It can overshoot the mark and come back. And then once you've gone round and round in circles a couple of times, um, they can sort of give up. But if you stop, go back to square one, come back to your last confirmed blood or mark, branch out from there, get back onto the track in a, in a new spot. So if you've gone round and round in circles in a 20 or 50 metre area and the dog's not tracking away from there, if you can find a mark, find the blood, get out onto the, the correct trail but into a fresh area of the correct trail, if that makes sense. So you, you, you're back on it and you've got out of the area where you've been going around and around in circles and the dog's back on it and you can and you've got your walk in front command or your way you go command all set up properly and you can just put the dog back on that clean trail again and go where you go and get them started again often they'll be away again and they'll and they might have given up because they were beginning to get confused whether that was what you wanted to be doing or not um but when you get them back on it again and say, way you go, they'll click and go sweet and they'll keep going. Um, remember, it's usually, especially if you've just shot it and you've waited a while and you're tracking it up, it's, it's very easy for a dog to track, follow a deer up, particularly a wounded one. And usually if they've got off or they're giving up, it's because they've got confused about whether you want them to keep tracking it up or they've just overshot it or they've, they've stopped concentrating for a moment or they've um, tracked off on a deer that isn't wounded um, and, they, and they're not confident enough to turn you back around and take you back down your track and look for it again. Um, I've had that where I've shot a deer, not a great shot, and it's ran off with a couple of other um, deer, and the wounded one's turned off, which they'll often do that. If they're wounded and the other ones are going quickly, and the other ones start going uphill, the wounded one will turn off, and had a young, inexperienced dog follow the two fresh ones, just because it was straight ahead, and the so the dog just naturally went that way. Um, and... That's where, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot to this, eh? Um, on the one hand, I, what I'll do is I'll have my GPS on and when I first start following a dog that's tracking a deer, even a wounded deer, I won't look for blood. I won't, if my dog's tracking, head, head down tracking or just even, not even head pinned down, if my dog's just tracking moving, taking me to a deer, trying to take me somewhere away from the spot that I've hit a deer. Um, I don't double check, I don't look around, I don't piss around because my body language, if my dog's trying to take me, my body language of checking for blood and wondering if it's gone this way, wondering if it's gone that way, can stuff the dog up. So the first thing I do is just confidently follow the dog. And, and that's one big part of why I'll always have my GPS on. I'll mark where I hit the deer, where I start tracking, and just follow the dog up with confidence. And, and that gives my dog confidence. Nine times out of ten, they're going the right way. And just that alone, you confidently following the dog up, gives the dog confidence and it'll track properly. And it's... it's uh, <clears throat> can be very surprising how even a little, a subtle a, a small amount of of your body language sort of subtly just looking out to the side any doubt creeping in on your side your dog will pick up on that very very quickly and start to question what it's doing um, and I've seen uh, tracking dogs from uh, tracking jobs that it, when a dog's going really well, completely stuffed up um, by that. I've even had it stuffed up by someone that's with me and I'm trying to confidently follow up my dog 
and someone behind me is like looking to the side oh is it going down here man i'll say no just follow the bloody dog man just trust me follow the dog and the person behind me is like veering off and questioning it and talking and stuff and i'm like let's just shut up and follow the dog for a while um and the dog's pretty much always been right you know um <clears throat> so that's a big one uh that confidence thing and just showing the dog that you trust it and following it up um if the dog does get lost having all that stuff set up so you can go back and start again and try to help the dog out to get back onto it um and then just persistence and consistency you know so um those are all the big ones for me um <clears throat> and then finally another another big one that i thought about um straight away when i first read this question is uh doing more tracking when you spook deer and things like that you know and i've sort of spoken about this before um some really good hunters with indicating dogs don't do a lot of tracking they don't like it they don't think it's effective um and you know you can you can make an argument for that that uh um you know a, following up on a direct wind is the most effective way to hunt over an indicating dog um you know and don't bother tracking spook deer and all that sort of thing um <clears throat> you know i off and on i do quite a bit of tracking and i've shot a lot of deer doing it i like doing it. i've spoken about that before i like getting led around my hunting areas by deer um i just like it um I don't always do it. I definitely don't track every deer I spook or anything like that. Um, and and I do spend a lot of time um, trying to get a dog onto a good direct win because it is a very effective way of hunting. But uh, if you don't do much tracking and you're always pulling your dog off and always looking for a win, then when the time comes that you actually need it, your dog might not be that good at it or... Not that it's not that good at it, you know, again, if it's relatively fresh, if it's from the last couple of few hours, um, it's very easy for a dog to track that animal. It's more about just that dog knowing that that's what you want it to do. Um, and spending a bit of time tracking while you're hunting can can really help that. Um, so that's, that's really um, all my key points on that is... Um, you could go back to doing your skin work, you know, in a, in a structured, that's sort of a, a outsider hunting in a structured training setup. Um, follow your dog confidently. Don't let the dog think that you're second guessing it um, and dogs can pick up on real subtle, I say for all intents and purposes, your dog's basically reading your mind. Um, don't even try to act like you're just going to follow it just follow it um, have your GPS on mark where you hit the deer mark blood and just follow the dog give it the benefit of the doubt even give it 15, 20 minutes, half an hour um, 100 metres, 200 metres, 300, 400 metres and if you if you haven't seen a mark or or you haven't seen any blood if there was good blood and all of a sudden the blood stopped and you're tracking another mark and you're thinking man i think this might be another deer go back have a look take your time um and give the dog a chance to turn off find that last blood um and see if an animal try to work out if an animal has turned off and and quite often um if you do, if you do find that the dog will pick that up again and start tracking again um help the dog out try to get the dog back onto it um and just track deer do, do more tracking before the shot um so when you do need it uh it's there as a tool actually one other big one um that i thought of just then was it's in the uh one of the recent 
videos we've put on YouTube. I think it's up on Facebook too. It's definitely on YouTube on the Big Game Indicating Dogs YouTube channel. <clears throat> uh, it's the title of the video. I'm pretty sure is hunting deer with big game indicating dogs. I'll just double check this. Oh, the title on YouTube is hunting deer with indicating dogs. And the, the thumbnail is a photo of print standing there. Um, tricolored dog with the deer laying in front of him it's just you just sort of see the side of the deer um, hunting deer with indicating dogs on big game indicating dogs youtube channel and in that video i talk about how um print was very good he's very good at tracking um and he he's very keen to find the deer after the shot but he's he's also more interested in finding any other deer that haven't been shot yet so if there's another deer if i shoot a deer and there's another one with it prince just thinking let's find that other one um and in that video i talk about how um i was just solidifying with print that command to find the deer after the shot same with any commands you can use whatever words you like whatever sound you like you're just linking an action with a command but I just choose a good, clear command. My one's just, where is he? Where is he? And that's my command that we're after that shot one. And I train that, uh, that old saying, train them on the easy ones so the hard ones are easy. The way I train that command for the dog to look for the dead deer when I need it to is when there's a dead deer laying right in front of me. So when I shoot one and it and it's a good shot and I can see it and we're approaching, I'm saying, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Really linking that command to that dead one. Um, and even if I do approach it, a, a dead deer and I'm saying, where is he? Where is he? Good boy. Good boy. I'm patting him. And if the dog looks away, I'll say, where is he? Where is he? And I'm even patting patting the side of the deer where is he and when he comes back over good boy i'm really ingraining that every time i walk up to a dead deer where is he where is he and um that can do it too if you're really consistent with that 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 wasn't in the blueprint um that was one of the many things that uh, uh well there's not many actually pretty much everything's in the blueprint that's one of the few things um that I've done so much that uh, I didn't even think to put it in the blueprint. I just always did it automatically. Um, and uh, I just always did it automatically myself. I did it with um, fly, uh, shooting goats every time. Well, with shooting goats because we're shooting more and we had to tail them and you'd have a contact where you shoot four or five goats and the dog's still trying to go after goats that are running away. Um, I had that with Fly and I'd say, where is he? Where is he? And she'd switch from trying to find the live goat that's running away that I haven't shot yet to coming back and picking up the ones I have shot. And, and you, can, you can get that into a very effective command. Um, and the dog knows straight away and make it a real positive thing when the dog gets to that dead one um, you know in the blueprint we we talk a lot about being calm around the dead deer not um, good dog good dog and all that crazy um, intensity uh, and that's important and it's a good thing you don't want your dog to start you don't want to big game indicating dog to start getting hyped up and excited as you're getting close to game but you still need to make sure that going to that dead one at the end is still a positive thing so it's it's about one of those balanced things um, and that's probably one of the very few things that I have swung back a little bit and said no nah, hang on um, it's good to keep it all calm but you also want to make sure that the dog knows it's a positive thing to take you to that dead deer um, and I sort of talk about that in that video, um, hunting deer over indicating dogs on YouTube. Um, Ryan 
Brian. Hi Paul, still having a little trouble with my stops. Whenever my pup has her nose to the ground, she forgets her sick command. When she's close to me and focused on me, she's all good while she's out in front on the long line. If her head is up looking at cars, kangaroos, etc., she's quite responsive, but if she's walking along nose to the ground, she's unresponsive to the sick command. Although fine with both whistle commands. It doesn't seem to matter if we're in a paddock filled with rupu, a relatively distraction-free road, school or oval to add. She's a five-month-old GSP. We're just about to get into part four of the blueprint. Also, should I hold back on part four, particularly intro to gunfire, till I get the stop drill issue sorted? Uh, quick side note, yes, you want a good stop solid stop drill before you get into the style of introduction to gunfire that we do in the dead dog training blueprint uh, back to the question any help would be appreciated update this is an edit to the question she's actually improved a lot since i posted this something must have clicked or i've just gotten a little sterner on her to add how long time wise should i expect her to be solid on a stop at this age that, like, how long should you expect? All that stuff sort of in the blueprint. Um, sounds still good. Thanks, Frank. That's awesome. Um, some people are starting to ask, ask questions on this live video. Can you please ask them in the new Q&A post that I put up after this video? Um, and I'll answer them in the next Q&A. That'd be great. And the more questions we get sooner, the sooner I'll do a QA. and a um, Okay, so a bit of an update from Ryan. He's saying she's actually improved. Um, something must have clicked or I've just gotten a, a little sterner. And yet a little sterner is what I was going to say you'll have to do. And then John comes in and says... Uh, basically the same thing. Um, after Ryan's question, hi Paul, my five month old visitor is walking out of front and will always stop on command but is reluctant to sit. When pushed, she will return to me and sit on my foot. I'm not sure this is all bad but not ideal. Any advice? It's definitely not ideal and, and once you've given a sick command, you don't want to let your dog return to you. If you've given a sick command and your dog's five meters in front of you and you say, dog sit, whatever your dog's name is, or sit. And the dog walks back, and it's in the blueprint. Um, step out to it and cut it off. As soon as it starts coming back, just say, ah, and step out quick. Um, you know, cut it and cut it off. Just And it's not over the top. You're just cutting it off. You've got the long line there. You can stand on the long line, or you can gently catch the dog and push it back to where it was when you first gave the sick command. Gently push its bum down if it tries. You know, at five months old, you're into that sort of gentle compliance work. Um, and just be super consistent. And then Ryan said, um, answered to John, Ryan and John are sort of having a little yarn here now. I noticed my GSP, who's at the same age, will sometimes come and sit against my leg or on my foot in the same situation if I'm putting a lot of pressure on her. And Ryan said, yes, exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> you just got to be firmer and and uh, more consistent and persistent and not let the pup get up, you know. Um, yeah, that, that's all it is. And and it, it's, it's not about getting real bossy. It's just about being more consistent, faster, sharper body movements, uh, better timing. The second that, you know, if your pup gets up and wanders back, um, it shouldn't even get to your foot. As soon as it gets up, you should say, or, or if you say sit and it turns around and walks back, you go, ah, and cut it off and gently push it back and sit it down. And then step back. If it gets up, ah, you sit it down. If you step back and it gets up, you go, ah, and sit it down. Ah, no, sit there. And then slowly move back. If you're at a point where you can't do that, you need to go back to that principle of just getting one or two seconds and one step back 
and then step back in, give it a pat, step back, one or two seconds, one step back, and then release. Go back to one or two seconds and one step back, and then you should be able to get to two or three seconds and two steps back, four or five seconds and three steps back. It's not how long and how far you can get back on that stop drill at the start. It's just a hundred percent consistency all the way through, and and again that principle of training and steps. As soon as you try to go five steps back and do a thirty second stop drill, and your pup gets up and w- tries to walk up to you and sit on your foot, then you've gone too far, or you've been too inconsistent, or you're not training enough, or your pup or dog is experiencing too much freedom and stimulation outside of training, or something's off. But uh, at five months old, following the blueprint, uh, you should have uh, a, you should have a pretty good sit going on. And, and but then in saying that, um, this is something we've talked about in a lot of um, Q and As. I went through that thing with print, and a lot of people go through it where you say sit. And the pup sits there and it's just stand. Sorry, the pup stands there. It stops when you say sit, and it stands there and looks back at you. And you just stay calm, step in, push its bum down, step back, do your stop drill, step back in, give a pat. You know how we do the stop drill in in the blueprint. It's we've got quite a um, procedure and routine that has. Uh, several steps to it and several key points separating praise from the release and all that really important stuff Um, getting eye contact and all of that some if five months are still pretty bloody young you should be getting close but if occasionally you still have to step in and push the pup's bum down don't be alarmed at it it's still a young dog it's still early days Um, but you shouldn't let it walk up to you and sit on your foot after you've said stop. And so in consistency and reading and timing are very important and all of that. Um, Very, very common in one-on-ones for people that say stuff like that, that, oh, my dog's sit just isn't quite on. And, um, you know, sometimes they get up and they come back and in a one-on-one I say, okay, give the sit command. And they say sit, and the dog sits down, and they might step in, give it a pat, and step back, and then the dog gets up and goes to walk towards them. And a couple of seconds later, they go to step in and push the dog's bum down, and it's like the second that pup gets up, you should be stepping in. They need to be like five times faster. They're the motions and timing. Everything's very slow and mushy when it needs to be fast and crisp. Not pup gets up. A second later, you slowly start stepping towards it and then go, no, sit back down, sit, and it's all wishy-washy, mushy. It needs to be the second that pup gets up, ah, and you're stepping in. Put it back on its sit. If it gets up, ah, hey, sit down, sit Pressure on what you don't want. And then a second it stays, release all that pressure. All your body language relaxes and you step away. And now you can start putting praise on it. The application and releasing of pressure and praise. With good reading and timing. Very, very important. Uh, Jeff. Hey Paul, we're halfway through part eight. Pat's all over it. When we bush train off track, he listens to commands and hand signals. Range is good, etc. But he's like a bloody bulldozer, not light on his feet at all, bashes through sticks, etc. But when we're in the paddock and he's stalking, eyeing pukekos, he's like a freaking ninja. I make sure I move slowly and quietly. It doesn't make any difference. I give command a disapproval. He thinks... He's just going in the wrong direction or breaking range. He's nine-month-old heading dog. Um, I wouldn't be too fussed about that. Um, We go into that in the blueprint in part 11. Um, 
11 and 12, I talk about slowing your dog down and getting them quiet in the bush. And if a not if a if a how old was it? Nine month old heading dog was a was just stoked and a bit noisy while I was doing my training in the bush. Um, I just wouldn't be too fussed about it. as long as it's the dog staying in range. Um, that would be okay for me, and I, I yeah I wouldn't. I mean yeah I'd put a bit of pressure on it. But remember again with that principle of pressure and praise, it's always the minimum amount of pressure or praise to get the job done. You don't want to go, ah, cut it out and make a big fuss when you could have just gone, hey, and it slowed down a little bit. If your pup's making a bit too much noise in the bush and you're putting pressure on him and he's taking it the wrong way, you may be overdoing it. Um, but yeah, so... It's a bit of a mixed bag on this one, but I'd probably try to put a bit of pressure on it. I'd keep it very minimum, minimal. Um, I wouldn't be too fussed about it at this point. If he's like a ninja stalking Pukekos, I would say he's probably going to be pretty good in the bush once he starts uh, getting on deer sign and you're actually hunting. Um, and if also if you've watched 11 and 12 of the Deer Dog Training Blueprint before you hunt, uh you'll know how I deal with it with print too. Um, yeah, that's my take on it. Um, keep doing it too. Um, if you've only done a couple of sessions in the bush, you might just be stoked to be up there and be crashing around. And when you put pressure on him out there because it's a new um, environment, he's taking it in the wrong way. When you just sort of need to spend, you need to relax a bit, spend more time doing it. Um Nine months old, still pretty young. You, you could still easily be, you know, three or four or five or six months away from hunting without uh, leaving it too long. Um, so that's my take on it, man. I, I wouldn't stress on it. I think it'll all smooth itself out um, over time. Yeah. Uh, Larry, Paul, are you doing any training clinics in Wellington or Featherston? Uh, not at this stage on the clinics, um, but I have been watching more and more people commenting on that post. Um, we've just got, I've got a lot on at the moment and I've had a lot on for a long time too. Um, and I'm sort of in the process of sorting out a whole bunch of stuff Um finishing off a couple of other projects and sort of working out where we're going from there. But um, it's definitely a high possibility that I will do them at some stage, um, but there's n I haven't got anything planned at this time. Um, Ross, on a recent hunt, my mate shot and wounded a hind we put my dog onto it about 45 minutes later and it started to track it <clears throat> but because it was one of a group of six i felt the dog was scenting all over the place and we never actually found the wounded animal do you have any suggestions for a situation like this and it's all the start of this um start of this q a man and that's why i sort of went into extra detail on caleb's question there um all that stuff is, is sort of very important and it's it's all in there man uh, Natasha hi Paul we are about to get a nine week old GSP we have three young kids how would you you suggest training with kids around especially at the beginning of training we can likely do four out of seven days with no kids also, when and how is the best time to introduce to our free-range chooks? Right from the start or after a bit of training? Thanks. Um, how would you suggest training with kids around, especially at the beginning of training? I wouldn't suggest training with kids around. Um, You know, and and as per the deer dog training blueprint, particularly at the start with a with a real young pup, um, it's very very important to get that time in a very low 
zero distraction environment. We're talking basically clean grass with nothing on it. Um, your lawn, a park or something like that. Um, and just spend that time, you know, and, and it's as little as sort of 10 or 15 minutes once or twice a day. Potentially for some people it's even a little bit less than that, but you've got to get that uh, zero distraction time in to start linking those actions with commands and start developing some of those patterns. Um, and with a pup or dog, with a pup or a young dog, with kids around making noise and being a distraction, it's just not going to happen. It's, it's no good. Um, but that's not to say that your pup or dog can't spend time um, with your kids. Um, but, you know, it's all within uh, rules and boundaries and limitations. You know, the old... Um, Caesar Milan thing um, and you've got to use a bit of judgment on it you know and and, and uh, your pup or dog spend time with your kids and, and play with them a little bit but you can go overboard with that and if a pup or dog spends loads of time um, playing with kids or out of control and then you want to put a long line on it and try to train it and get it to do stop drills and stuff that those stop drills can seem quite boring to all of that playing that it's been doing and it can be very difficult to get consistent results. And that's why uh, kenneling and quiet time and, and structure for a, a pup that you want to be a well-trained dog is so important. And that's why too much freedom and um, playing with kids and all of that can make that job um, quite difficult. So... Uh, it's quite a biggie. We've talked about this in a lot of Q and A's. Um, if you haven't got the Palmico Dog Guide as well, it could be worth upgrading and having that with the blueprint. That's got more details in it on that. Uh, if you want to do that, you can um, message us and we'll sort something out there. Um, but uh, there's no easy answer to this. Um, there's not. But all I can say is. The more training you can do in a low distraction environment, the better. Um, the more calm and quiet and structured you can keep your pup or dog's life, the better. Um, the more limited and calm and structured you can keep the time that your kids spend with your pup or dogs early on, the better. And the better you are with all of that stuff, the better progress you'll make through training and the, the quicker you'll reach a conclusion to your training and you'll have a fully trained dog that knows how to do everything that it needs to do and from there on out you can start to give it more fun and freedom and then it can just be a relaxed part of the family spending lots of time with your kids it'd be a great hunting dog it'd be a great pet it'll be great all around um, but if you introduce too much fun and freedom and you don't employ enough structure early on, you can start running into problems that will cause you issues for the rest of your dog's life. And some of those problems and issues will actually cause you to have to, you know, you'll, you'll have problems and you have to restrict your dog for the rest of its life versus dealing with it properly early on and getting it all done properly out of the way and then your dog can enjoy a lot of fun and freedom for the rest of its life so that that whole thing there of doing the worst first doing it all properly getting it all done getting it out of the way um is is it's again it's really it's all about giving the dog it's be, the best life possible and and uh dogs a lot of dogs that end up living pretty shitty lives, a lot of that comes about by trying to give them too much fun and freedom early on and it all ends up backfiring and turning to shit, just to be quite frank and blunt about it. Um, the chooks, also how is the best time to introduce to our free range chooks right from the start or after a bit of training, I would start doing that with the GSP right from the start on the long line and I would be pretty bloody firm with it. Um, 
we show you how I introduce print to fly on the long line in part one of the deer dog training blueprint um, and I do it on a long line in a way that I'm, I'm introducing print to the idea that he can't necessarily just run around and do whatever he wants completely out of control and that there's going to be control and structure with everything including the way he plays and socializes with other dogs you can use that same principle with introducing a pup or dog to anything like chickens where you've got them on, I had print on the long line. Um, I was using non communicator trainings, a lot of stuff. It's all there in part one of the blueprint. But um, uh, to give a bit of free value for people listening, things like that, do it on a long line. A long line, I've got, we've got free videos on YouTube, on big game indicating dogs, um, YouTube channel <clears throat> on what a long line is and some really basic videos on how to use it. There's miles and miles of really advanced stuff in the blueprint on them. But uh, a, a long line is just a, a six or seven meter long piece of four mil nylon cord with a loop tied on one end and it's got a running loop around the dog's neck. Um, and it's a long line. Um, very, very old um, fundamental piece of dog training equipment for a lot of people uh, training things like bird dogs, hunting dogs, sheep dogs. Um, and it's just a long piece of string so the dog's got freedom to run around and move um, but you've still got control of it um, so I would do that I would Natasha with the the GSP and the chickens I do a lot of that sort of work around the chickens with the long line and I'll be very very firm on it and I wouldn't even look let the pup look at them um, and stalk them and point them or any of that sort of stuff but it'd, it'd just be the I'd be very firm on it but I'll also say this, um, if you think you're going to have a GSP pup or dog running around free range with free range chickens long term with no chance of that GSP killing those chickens, uh, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'm definitely not going to be the guy to tell you that it is possible and then I'm going to help you to do it <laughs> because... Uh, uh, yeah, a German short haired pointer and free range chickens. Um, I'll easily train a dog to stay away from chickens while I'm there controlling it, and I'll get a dog to the point where I can do that off leash easily, and the blueprint will do that for you. But uh, long term, with free range chickens around and a, G and a GSP, even well trained, that's going to be a slippery situation. Um, any moment you turn your back or let your guard down or get out of sight or something like that. And the thing is, you could train that dog to, you know, German short ear pointer is that's a, they've got a, they're very birdie. It's a bird dog. Uh, they've got a lot of drive. Um, the whole everything about them is geared to kill those chickens um, and again 100% you can train a dog to be steady around birds steady off leash and all of that and the blueprint will do it for you um, but uh, it's going to be a pain in the ass having chickens around and trying to not have that dog end up having a crack at one at some point unless you're just very consistent with that dog's either in a kennel or be, being directly handled you know what I mean um, that's my take on that yeah um, <clears throat> on any of this stuff guys feel free to um, comment back or send another message or make another post or ask another question and we can keep bouncing back and forth on any of this stuff in the inner circle uh, Joshua hey Paul just picked up my pup from the pet shelter she's a six month old Catahoula mix possibly pointer or collie really calm and quiet Catahoula's a bloody smart dogs man and, and something like that crossed with collie or a pointer or something could um, could and will make a really good indicating dog it's, it's yeah uh, I've just about finished part back to the question I've just about finished part 
Oh, I've finished a week. I've just about finished a week of the blueprint training. First question is about kenneling. Because of my job, I will be away 6.30 a.m. to roughly 6 to 6.30 p.m. 12 hours seems like a long time without letting her out, out for a stretch. I have her in a run with a box at the end. I'm wondering if she should be using the bathroom in the run or if I should be should have someone to let her out while I'm at work. <clears throat> 12 hours is a long time. Um, it's, it's not out of the question. Either people do it and you can do it. Um, 12 hours is a length of time where I would expect a dog to start going to the toilet out on the run occasionally, um, depending on the dog and depending on your feeding times and how much exercise the dog's getting before and after going in and out of the kennel. Um, but again, I'm not saying you can't do 12 hours. Um, you can do it, people do it, um, and it can be fine. Um, however, if you can have someone come out and let her out during that time, then that would be ideal too. Um, and that's about all I can say, man, if you've got a dog and you have to do it. Um, again, 12 hours is a long time. I say anything up to about 8 hours is okay. Anything over there is starting to stretch it out a little bit. Um, but you can do it. But if you have, and, and a dog left in for that long is going to probably go to the toilet in the run sometimes. Um, you know, out of its box in the run. That's not the end of the world. That's kind of what they're for. Um, as long as dog's got plenty of water in there, it's warm enough, it's cool enough in the summer and all that sort of thing. Um, it's not the end of the world, man, and you can do it. Um, but yeah, if you can have someone pop around and let them out, then that'd be awesome too. Um, he goes on to say, I notice she has been chewing on the kennel or her beard a bit while in there. Chewing on the kennel's no good. Um, and that's where it can be important to have a well-designed kennel that actually has no wooden areas that the dog can chew. Most really good kennels are like that, like a proper... Um, hurricane mesh kennel and run with the right spacing in the floorboards so that the, um, a dog can't get its teeth around any of the timber floorboards and then also the framing and the, the kennel, the box should be properly lined and if there's wood around the opening of the box there should be tin wrapped around it so that the dog literally can't chew it, it's all, there could be steel in its construction but the way, uh, excuse me, there could be wood in the construction but the way it's constructed and laid out and wrapped and everything, the dog can't actually get its teeth around it. Um, and that can be pretty important. Uh, from my experience, most dogs, other than um, a dog that's really quite mature, um, three, four, five years old, they'll get to a stage where even when left in a dog box or a kennel, or a crate for long periods of time, they just won't chew it, they just get past that stage. Um, in my experience, dogs younger than that, and definitely pups, um, if they're in a situation where there's something they can chew, whether it's the design of their kennel allows them to chew wood, or you put a dog bed in there, or anything in there, or a plastic bowl or anything like that, they're going to chew it, you know, and that's where good steel dog bowls and all that comes in. Um, with bedding, uh, if it's in a kenneling situation, again, usually I just won't bother giving pups a big fluffy bed in their kennel because they'll just destroy it. Um, they'll either get nothing, um, or if it's real cold, I'll give them something that's not as easy to chew. Like you get, um, you can get even just old blankets or an old towel or something, put it in there, and they might chew it up a little bit, and I'll throw it away once it's completely destroyed and throw something else in there. Um, and sort of try to ride it out the best I can um, over that first year or so until the dog starts to get into the point where they stop chewing, and they do, and it's a phase, and they grow out of it. Um, but again, it's one of these things that the better you can manage it earlier on, and and the the less situations that you can put your pup or dog in that it's chewing. So, not giving it stuff like plastic water bowls or having it in wooden dog boxes that they can chew and stuff like that um, the less you can do that then the less the pup or dog's chewing then the less of a habit it's creating um, and and pups or dogs that pup or dog that is raised in a situation where it's regularly chewing 
often that habit will follow it through into adult life and that's where you get a dog that'll chew stuff forever but um so that's sort of my take on that man good kennel and um just i just try to manage it the best i can if i get really pissed off with it they just get nothing um and 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 i go from there um then if it's really cold i'll just throw something in it that that's not so chewable it doesn't have nice fluffy stuff that they can pull out or anything like that just a blank blanket or an old towel or something like that um, and i'll take it out if it gets too destroyed um he says uh Oh, do you suggest a chew toy for this? Um, yeah, and you can do that. That's one alternative, giving them an actual bone or a chew toy. So it's something that you actually want them to chew on, and that can work, it really can. Um, I don't go crazy. I, I like my chew toys to be something edible, um, like a bone or like a pig's ear um, dog chew that you get from the... Um, you know, animates or pet shop or vets or something, or you get those, you know, the hide ones are like a bone that's turned, twisted into a something, um, or even big, proper big cannon bones and things like that. Um, so I'm not teaching my dog to chew random objects. That comes back to that building habits thing. I, I always, if I'm giving a pup or dog something to chew, I want it to be perceived as a food item, not <laughs> just something to chew. Um... And if she starts chewing, give her the command. That command of disapproval, definitely. Um, and you know, if as some of these things arise, you might sit you, when you have the time and you're around on a weekend. You may put her in a in a kennel outside, or put her in a crate nearby, and just sit down and might be watching TV or reading a book or do whatever, uh, doing something in the workshop. Have your dog kenneled next to you or crated next to you, and every time it starts chewing, just hey, give it a command of disapproval. Stamp your foot. And it pressure on what you don't want. Let the pup or dog know that you don't want it doing that. Um, yeah, 100% command disapproval. Um, next question is about the come command training. It seems to be remembering here that he's a week in. Um, seems to be working well. She'll come to me when she's focused, but apparently there are tons of smells in the grass that can be very distracting. And when she is on these, she will not come unless I use a long line. <clears throat> Should I work these issues with the come command out before proceeding to the stop and go commands? Or should I proceed working on all three together? That being said, she's probably already better behaved than most dogs I know. And it's been a week of the blueprint. Looking forward to the next 12 months. Thanks. Um, thanks for those cool comments, Joshua. Um... I would just basically comes back to just follow the blueprint. So at the start, we start working on our come command and our stop and go. And the, the even right from the start, right with the eight week old pup, we're not doing any compliance work. We're just, as things are happening and we're keeping it fun and light, we're basically just linking sounds with actions and keeping it all positive. Um, and, and that's what we use a long line for. So when we first, and that's where we come back to that zero distraction um, environment where we're training, we're, we're taking that time out to get into that direct one-on-one -on -one environment, zero distraction with a long line on, and we're starting to run our drills. And right at the start, we're just working on come, stop and go, um, calm engagement, a couple other things. But the main things we're working on is is a come and a stop and a go and at the start we're not even doing compliance so we're not saying hey you must stay or stop and stay there um we're just linking actions with commands um and the reason why we do all three is because when you're out there walking around with a pup or dog on a long line it will be there'll be times when it's coming towards you There'll be times when it's not moving and there'll be times when it's not moving and it's about to move again. And that's where we use the come. We start linking those actions with those commands, the come, the stop, and the go. That's all we're really doing. Um, we do create those situations by saying come and use the long line to get the pup or dog to come towards us. And we do sort of stop the pup, gently push his bum down, say sit, give it a bit of a pat while it's there. And then all of a sudden we'll go, 
our go command and move again. Lincoln wise access to the commands, but we do them. The reason why we do all three together is because they generally all three are happening anyway. Um, so we're just sort of trying to get in there and, and um, start to link our commands to those things that are already happening. Um, yeah, so that's me on that. That's my take on that, Joshua. Um, keep us posted on that, man. Six month old Catahoula mix, um, rescue dog by the sounds of it. Um, be keen to know we're keen to know how all pups and dogs are, are going in the in the blueprint in the inner circle but keep us posted on that um, Nigel my pup is six months old real slow and sick command I stand on the long it's, this is the same thing I'll stand on the long line he'll sit on his own but does it in his own time takes three or four seconds before his bum goes down is there anything I can do to speed up his response or will this just come with time and training? The thing you can do to speed up his response is you speed up your response to him not sitting. And it comes back to instead of, um, I don't know what your pup's name is, say your pup's name's Max. Instead of you going, sit Max. And then Max taking three or four seconds and three or four seconds later you go, sit Max. And then three or four seconds after that you sit, you step in and say, sit Max. You go, sit Max. Max sit and you step straight in, bang, you're onto it. And it's not, you're not um, pushing the dog around, you're not um, being super overbearing. You can actually be upbeat about it, but your body movement and your timing and even the way you say stuff speeds up. Everything's just quick. Uh, it's huge, man your tone and speed and body language and handling a dog and, and it's the old saying dogs are like a mirror um good morning carl from the uk <laughs> i just looked over and read that uh dogs are like a mirror man and usually when they're going slow it's because we're going a bit slow um, and you can just sharpen everything up and they'll sharpen up. Uh, but also, this is that same thing. It's fairly common. I had it with print. Um, six months old ain't that, isn't, isn't that old. And uh, just keep repeating the process and they'll come on in their own time. Early days yet. Watch ahead. Watch your head, and that was also um, come up with Ryan. He said, "Oh, I don't know if I should be moving on. I'm on part four. Should I hold off and this and that?" And watch your head, and you'll pick up on stuff that you can bring forward. Watch your head in the deer dog training blueprint. Watch the whole bloody thing if you can. Uh, man, the amount of people that have they've, they've bought the whole thing. And they've been training for months. And they've even started hunting. And I almost have to drag it out of them. I'm like, oh, my dog. Yeah, my dog's good. The blueprint's been great. I've loved it, this and that. My dog does this or my dog does that. Or what do you do when you do it? And I'm like, that's in part 11. Have you watched part 11? And they're like, oh, no, I haven't. And I'm like, well, you've... <laughs> and they own it. And they haven't watched it. Um, I know I sort of... Um, it drags on a bit. But uh, there's a lot in there. But there's a lot to this whole dog thing. Um, there really is. Nigel goes on to say, uh, he has just started to let out the odd bark while in the back of the ute. Not often and not every time, never while the ute has stopped, so finding it hard to try and correct this. I don't think you can hear my commander disapproving. Have you got any advice on this? <clears throat> yeah, that can, be, that can be a pain in the ass. And we actually talked about that in a recent Q&A. And, and I was talking about how my dogs do it occasionally um, on the way to um, taking them for their run. And it often that thing often comes about uh, it's an anticipation thing uh, my dogs didn't start doing it till I moved to town and I had this short sort of two minute drive to the spot where I run them and I actually have several different places I take them to 
um, around here on the beach and the dunes and the park and a few spots. Um, but as soon as I get into a pattern of going to the same spot about the same time and they start picking up on it, they start anticipating we go into the park and we're going to have our run and they'll start having the odd yip on the way. Um, and it's funny how you say uh, your dog doesn't do it when you stop. That's because you're not moving towards where they want to go anymore. So they're not, you don't get that anticipating bark. Um, yeah, so... <clears throat> uh, You'll generally find if your pup or if you can, if you do all your kennel training properly, um, that it's generally just an anticipation thing, and it's it'll generally only happen on the shorter trips where your pup or dog knows where they're going, um, and on long, longer trips it won't be an issue once the dog doesn't know where it's going anymore. It's not much of an issue. Um, uh, fly was a pain in the ass for it um and sometimes i'll actually pull because it's the same thing you can't do it and they can't hear sometimes i'll actually got the window of the canopy open they're in the dog box in the back and i've got the window of the canopy open and i'm driving up the road in town here um hanging out the window go cut it out fly and and she'll hear me and she'll shut up and then if i give her one or two commands of disapproval and she keeps barking then i'll pull over open the back and I'm sticking my head in the canopy and I'm going, fly! Sort of threatening her and pointing at her and stuff and she's a very soft dog. You just give her, you even look at her like you're going to do something and she's groveling in the back of the dog box. But um, there just has to be a consequence. And um, another thing I did actually which really knocked it on the head was um, every time they did it, I just pulled over and stopped. And, and actually when it was getting worse for me, was when I was in a hurry and I got in a pattern of doing it and I was driving straight across the road and they were barking a bit and I'd get there and let them out straight away just after they'd finished barking. I was actually driving over and if they had barked, I'd just sit there and pull my phone out and check my emails or reply to a message or do something for a couple of minutes and was creating separation between the barking and letting the dog out to do the thing that it was anticipating when it was barking. Um, yeah, that's my take on that, man. It shouldn't be an issue. Um, it can be a hard one. It can be a pain in the ass. But like you're saying, it's just the odd bark here or there. As long as you're firm on it, if it gets worse, stick your head out the window and yell at it and don't worry about what passes by. think if it gets worse, pull over give the dog a stern command disapproval and also if it gets worse create that separation between the dog barking and then getting that positive result getting what it wants uh, right after it's barked just make it wait a while even just a couple of minutes instead of turning straight up right after it's been barking and letting it straight out the back just separating it by a couple of minutes, calms everything down and, and breaks that link. <clears throat> Ange, she says she's bringing home an eight-week-old GSP on Saturday. Can I use the inside crate for when we are home and the outside run for when we are away, wanting him to be more of an inside dog? <clears throat> You can, and again, the Palmico Dog Guide would be a great add-on for you at, here as we go into a lot of that inside crating and do, doing inside crating while also doing the things that you need to do to make sure you set up both so you end up with a pup or dog that is comfortable in a kennel outside and comfortable in a crate inside. You can do that. There's no problem with crating a pup or dog inside. Um, the one big word of warning here though is can we use a crate inside for when we are home and the outside run for when we are away? <clears throat> you can run into trouble doing that by crating 
a pup inside i'll run through a quick scenario for you people will go get a pup bring it home i think and you were asking about crating the dog in the back and stuff like that too on the way home um the classic case scenario here is someone completely oblivious goes and picks up their pup it sits on their lap all the way home um, it comes straight inside, they pick it up on a Saturday morning, it comes straight inside, sleeps on the bed or sleeps in a crate right next to their bed or, or somewhere like that. Um, they spend time with it 24-7 all weekend. Then Monday morning they have to go to work and they put the pup in a kennel and leave and the pup's just going ape shit all day. And then they come home, take the pup out of the kennel and now the pup's back inside and on their lap and spending all that time with them. And that is training separation anxiety. That's like generating, creating separation anxiety. That's how you do it. Textbook. Um, and that's uh, unfortunately the way a lot of people uh, handle their pup or dog or, or that's how they go about it um, when they get a pup or dog. Um, and that's why we do things the way we do it in the blueprint. Um, and and in the Palmico dog guide, again, we go into a lot more for the people that want to ha- create their pup or dog inside in that while also going into all of that stuff on how to do both. But um, again, to not just have my answer be watch the blueprint, or the Palmico dog guide, um, you can create your pup inside, and that's fine. But right from day one, um, bite the bullet and put it in its crate or in its kennel outside, and walk it. Get it tired again. All those same principles. Spend plenty of time with it. Wear it out get it tired till and it's perfect with an eight week old pup you can get them to the point where they're almost falling asleep on their feet eight week old pups have little batteries they run flat pretty quick and you get them absolutely buggered make sure they're warm comfortable fed watered been to the bathroom all that sort of stuff put them in that kennel or crate outside in a comfortable spot and walk away separate them let them cry it out and fall asleep and then go back to them while they're calm and quiet and sleeping and let them out. And and it's that rip the band-aid off and doing it early on and making it as easy on the pup as you can. And because even one night sleeping with you inside one that first one trip on your lap in the truck makes that first time that they have to go in the dog box in the back so much harder for them. You're making it harder for the pup. You're making it harder on the pup or the dog for when it does have to do that later on in life. And and that one night inside in the crate with you is making it so much harder for the dog later in life. When Even if it's hunting one day, and, and this is a classic case scenario, with a hunting dog and someone says, but my dog will sleep inside all the time. What if you go to a hut on Dockland and there's some grumpy old fella there that says, hey, there's no bloody dogs in the huts. Get him out of here. And I've seen it. <laughs> and now you've got someone's dog going ape shit on the deck, on the veranda, the whole trip. And the dog's miserable because you never taught it how to be comfortable on its own outside at the start. So you've actually set your dog up for anxiety and issues. So it's all about setting that pup or dog up to be happy and comfortable in all situations for us and them. You know, and that's really important. Um, so, so it's relatively simple, you know, there's, there's lots of ins and outs and in the Palmico dog guide I actually show you what I do with Miko step by step and all of that. Um, but it's relatively simple. Crating inside is okay, but right from that day one, take that time, put it outside, bite the bullet, get it worn out, tired, 
comfortable, fed, watered, go into the bathroom with all of that and put it in its crate and walk away and go back to it when it's quiet. You can give it a command to disapprove if it's going nuts. You can bang on the crate or stop you and say, hey, just to break the pattern. But the main moral of the story is let it cry it out, let it calm down, and then go back to it when it's quiet. Take it out, give it a pat, spend some time with it, wear it out again, put it back in, do the worst first. Get it. It's going to be good inside with you inside. That's easy. That's the easy part. Um, and the thing is, is the more you do that easy thing early on, the harder you're making the hard thing. When you do the hard thing first, it's easier <laughs> and then the easy thing's easy after after that you know so anyway that's my take on that and um i hope that makes sense kelly we have a female two-year-old gsp lab cross who is steady intelligent and fairly well trained but our lack of experience has led her down a little we let her sleep with our 14-year-old lab from... This is quite a timely question after that last one. We let her sleep with our 14-year-old... So two, this is a two-year-old GSP lab. They've let her sleep with your 14-year-old lab from day one. And, he is, and the 14-year-old lab is starting to near the end of his life. And now the two-year-old GSP lab barks continuously if she is in the kennel without him that's another thing we do in the palmiko dog guide when i was training miko and she slept inside in a crate every night right from the start but i started kenneling her outside on her own as well right from the start um and i started doing it at a time when i was around so i was there to deal with it Instead of, and going back to Angie's question, if you, that's why it's very important to be proactive about it and actually go out of your way to do that introduction to separation training while you're around because that's when you're around to deal with it. If you just keep the pup with you and create it inside and then put it in a kennel and leave, you're not there to deal with it. You're not there to go back to the pup as soon as it's calm and quiet. And you're not there to hit all those markers. Um, but another thing I did with Miko was even though I had other dogs and she was, I was kenneling with other dogs, I went out of my way to bring all the other dogs inside and put Miko out in the kennel on her own. So, Because otherwise I'm just training you, I'm training you to be in a kennel outside, but I'm only training you to be in a kennel outside with that dog right next to her. Um, so I'm always thinking about worst case scenario and doing the worst first um, because that's the least least stress on the dog um, I'm searching those things out and getting them out of the way as soon as possible because that's the easiest, fastest, best way of dealing with them and then they're done um, all the stuff that I'm talking about Kelly it goes for this your dog um, it's dealing with it while you're away it's getting that that two-year-old gsp lab absolutely buggered being proactive about it picking a weekend okay this is the first weekend we're going to start sorting this out and do it while that dog's still around don't wait till it's it's gone um wear that dog out and put it in its kennel and walk away um Another thing you can do if you've got to the point here where it might be like really, really bad and the thing is with going back to talking about how an eight-week-old pup's got little batteries that run flat quick, that's another reason why I do it right from day one with a young pup is um, a young pup can only go nuts for a certain amount of time and they just, like I said, they're falling asleep standing up. And then once they fall asleep, you go back to them and let them out. And that's teaching them that, hey, if I just calm down and relax and go to sleep, the boss is going to turn up and let me out and give me a pat. The best, the quickest way to get let out of here is to calm down and go to sleep. Um, and it's easy to get that opportunity with a young pup because they run out of energy and they go to sleep and you, and you let them out. 
and you're teaching them, calm down, go to sleep to be led out of the kennel. One other thing here to keep bloody going a real tangent on this whole thing is with dogs, with this type of thing, how dogs work is every time they get to the end of something and they're okay is teaching them that that thing was okay. You have to get to the conclusion. And you can keep repeating an activity or a, a, a scenario or a situation that doesn't go well. And if you don't get to a correct conclusion, you haven't taught the dog anything. Often you've, you're making it worse and worse because you're just teaching the dog that that situation isn't good, it's confusing or it's stressful or it's no good and you're making it worse and worse. It's very, very important no matter what you're doing, introduction of gunfire, water, fixing phobias, kenneling, separation, anything, a stop drill. It's all about doing it well, perfectly, consistently, and reaching a positive conclusion, no matter how short it is, you know, come back to that two second stop drill, or 10 minutes in a kennel, five or 10 minutes in a kennel where a pup cries it out for 10 minutes, calms down for two, two minutes, and then you turn up and let it out, you've just uh, carried out a full revolution of the process that you want to, to um, how you want that kenneling to go. Even if it's 10 minutes, you want kenneling to be the dog goes in there, it calms down, and it gets let out. Goes in there, calms down, it gets let out. That's the pattern you're trying to uh, set up. And then you just make it longer and longer. But the thing is, is a dog, every time the dog goes in there, you lock it up, you walk away, it calms down, you turn up, let it out, and everything's okay. Every time that happens, the dog's more likely to calm down next time. Every time you put the dog in there and it starts going nuts and you let it out while it's going nuts, it's more likely to go nuts next time because you're training it that going nuts is what gets the positive conclusion and gets let out. And... That's why it's so important to do it, get it done with a young dog, with a young pup, because you, they've got little batteries, they, they, they run out of energy quick, go to sleep, you let them out, then they go flat out for three or four hours and you get another opportunity to do it all over again. A two-year-old GSP lad, that thing can go for two days. <laughs> and then it only needs a couple of hours sleep and it can go for two days again. So... It's always so important to get this thing sorted out um, properly um, right from the start. But uh, going back to, to Kelly here with the two-year-old GSP lab, it's the same principles, man. I would choose a weekend, choose a Saturday, get that dog up early, keep it going all day, give it a massive feed, choose a nice, you know, ideally a nice warm afternoon and all that sort of thing. So everything's lined up, the dog's just buggered, fed, warm, comfortable, everything. Lock it up and walk away and and hopefully you can get that dog all wear out and calm down and relax and then you leave it for as long as you dare because if, if a dog like that goes from making noise to calming down and then wakes up and starts up again, now you've got an issue. But if you get to it while it's calm, it's good. You're better off going out and letting it out after being calm for one minute than going for 10 and having it wait, starting up again. You know, small steps at the start. <laughs> if you can start making getting small wins, it's good. Um, and getting get to that positive conclusion. Uh That's what I would do and then try to wear that dog out and do that and, and get it to the point where it calms down, goes to sleep and you turn up while it's calm and quiet and let it out and teach it that that's what, get, that's what it gets let out. 
Um, uh, this isn't a, as popular with everyone, but a hose can work very good if a dog's out. We've talked about this in Q and A's before. If a dog's standing out on its run barking, you don't even you're not even wetting the dog. You're not hosing it down or anything. But quite often, a squirt even just towards the kennel. A, a dog will usually bark out on its run if it's barking in a kennel and run situation, um, or even chained to a kennel and chain situation. They're usually not sitting in their box barking. They get up out of their box and bark on the run or they get up out of the box and bark on the chain. You flick, you point a hose at them and they jump in their box and shut up. And you can go, <clears throat> cut it out. And then if the dog doesn't cut it out, you go, you, you pick up the hose. So you're linking the commander disapproval with the hose and you go, cut it out, squirt. And you know, again, you, you usually don't even really. Dog, most dogs know what a hose is. You usually don't even need to hit them with, you know, hit them with the water. You don't even need to get them wet, or maybe just like a little, you know, just clip them with it, sort of thing. Um, and they'll jump back in their box, and uh, you walk away, and they start again. As soon as they start up, you go cut it out. And then if they keep going, you come back, pick up the hose, point it at them, and you go cut it out, and another squirt. And eventually, when you go cut it out, they think, oh, no hose, and they actually start shutting up and jumping back in their box. That can be another trick. Um, even just as simple as cut it out, and when they've been barking, walk out there and bang on the lid, bang on the kennel with a, with a stick or something. Um, putting pre- pressure on what you don't want, praise on what you do want. Um those types of things. Um, man, I've had some shockers. Doing the deer dog training boot camps, um, I had some shockers. Um, and we managed to sort most of them out. Well, we sorted all of them out with the kennel thing eventually, but um, most, some of them that were really bad, we actually got on top of it quite quickly. Um, okay, so that's that. <clears throat> the second question for Kelly on this two-year-old GSP lab is this is the two-year-old GSP lab that is fairly well trained but our lack of experience has led her down a little we walk her through an adjoining kiwi fruit orchard and we've let her run off to explore without any control for the past two years knowing she will come to her whistle it now means she thinks she can run off every time she is off her lead to explore. She is not that interested in other dogs. So as good like that, if I say heel, she will come and sit beside me without the lead. Um, she goes on to say she would have naturally walked ahead as a puppy. I'm guessing we're referring to the how we set up a deer dog walking in front. She would have naturally walked in front as a puppy as opposed to healing and watching your video would have probably been relatively easy to train with a long line to do this is it too late to go back and then break two years of habit my husband is a deer stalker and she is so quiet in her temperament and has taken after the point to say we are wondering if she could still achieve this you definitely sort that out for sure and and even if it's uh might be the sort of dog you need to hunt on the long line to start off with um that's another principle um of dog training that we talk about exposing weakness um, lots of time right from the start before you've set up all your training and range and everything um, a dog running around free off the long line um, you're just training them that they can do it and you get to a point where every time you let them off a the lead they'll, they're running around you know um, but if you hook into the blueprint get a long line on follow all of that stuff um, basically you know, with the blueprint in an older dog, you just follow it exactly like you, you just start from the start and start working your way through and, and the blueprint. It's the same principles, you know, with an older dog. You put a long line on it and set up your um, stop, go and come. Um, and then once you've got the beginnings of that, you want to get the dog walking out in front and then we start working on our stop command and then our range and our non-communicative range and... Um, 
our skin work and introduction to gun fire and steadiness to gun fire and all of that stuff. It's all the same stuff whether you're working. Um, some, some of the things you'll have properly, you'll have straight away with an older dog if you start at part one. Um, you might have a sit command so you can just get your cum better um, and once you sort all that stuff out then you just move on to part two um, and so on and so forth. But you just sort of work through it um, working on all the things you, you haven't got um, and the things you do, you already do, so it's fine, you know. Uh, but 100%, not too late, and you can do it. Um, the only thing you might have to be prepared to do is hunt on the long line a bit, but once you've trained properly um, with the blueprint, having a dog hunting on a long line isn't a big deal anyway because it's all nice and clean and tidy, and it's just not a big deal, you know. Um, I throw the long line back on print, and fly occasionally you know um it's just it's just easy once you've got them properly trained on a long line for indicating work it's very easy to just throw it back on and they're very good on it um <clears throat> yeah so that's it susan Wondering about advantages, disadvantages of de-sexing, I have a male pup. Um, this is something we've I've hammered out in both Q&As and I've made like whole separate videos. So we'll find that for you, Susan, and we'll post it here. Um, we'll post it in the inner circle. It's up on Facebook and YouTube somewhere, um, but we'll actually find it and post it in the inner circle for you and we'll tag you in it or we'll put it as a reply to that question or something. So... That's it, guys. That's it for this Q and A. Uh, I see people have been asking a few questions again. If you've been asking questions on this live in a circle uh, Q and A, can you post them on the next Q and A post? That will go up as soon as this goes up tomorrow. Um, and we'll answer them there. But if you've asked a question and you miss this part, we'll um, I'll just screenshot them or copy and paste them in anyway. So I'll make sure we get to them. Uh, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone who's signed up to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint and the Palmico Dog Guide. That's sort of really how all this stuff comes about. We can't do this without people actually signing up. Um, thanks to all our listeners and viewers. Again, if you want to find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, you can do that or even find out more about Big Game Indicating Dogs and loads of stuff, um, how we hunt, Big Game Indicating Dogs on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. We've got loads of free content. We've got loads of free videos on YouTube. Um, or you can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com, loads of info on the Deer Dog Training Blueprint there. We've got a whole page with all these Q&As up on it and all the time codes. So you can actually go through, instead of having to listen to hours and hours of Q&As, you can actually have a bit of a scroll through and even do a search and find the topics that you want to listen about. Um, it's it's quite good there. Um, we've got our hunting videos, loads of stuff. Big Game Indicating Dogs on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Or just go direct to biggameindicatingdogs.com. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later.